Brain disorders cause 25% of health loss due to disability, which is eight times greater than the coronary artery disease and 20 times greater than cancers. UNMC Movement Disorders Clinic see 6,000 patient encounters every year. So we're gonna talk about movement disorders today and I am gonna make you an expert in movement disorders in 10 minutes. So what impact can we make? What effect we can have on the lives of our patients as a movement disorder neurologist? <laughs> राइट वाले को करें खड़े हो जाएं खड़े हो जाएं जरा खड़े हो जाएं खड़े हो जाएं शाबाश हाथ सामने करें This patient is a 35-year-old male who is a labor worker doing manual jobs in Middle East. He was visiting Pakistan uh, in one of his um, vacations and towards the end of it, when it was time to go back, he started having these disabling movements. It's been a year and a half. He has seen three neurologists. He has gone through all kinds of treatment, has had botulinum toxin injections, and was just not getting better. When I tell them a diagnosis after a very difficult, complicated examination lasting an hour, they wouldn't believe me. But I offered them an intervention, and they agreed to go along with me and followed that intervention. <laughs> वापस जाइएगा सर डायग्नोसिस बताएगा सो दिस इज हिम 3 मंथ्स आफ्टर द इंटरवेंशन 3 मंथ्स आफ्टर द ट्रीटमेंट कैन यू वन मेक अ डायग्नोसिस एंड सजेस्ट व्हाट थेरेपी माइट हैव वर्क फॉर हिम एनी थॉट्स एनी टेकर्स so I diagnosed him with psychogenic movement disorders and I offered them to go through psychotherapy and do a cognitive behavioral therapy, a form of psychotherapy. And this is him three months after the psychotherapy and after stopping all of the medications. So this tells you uh, as an example that there is real meaningful difference that you can make as a movement disorder neurologist in the lives of patients. Over the next eight minutes, we will be reviewing a little bit of functional anatomy an approach to movement disorders, including a classification, a basic classification of movement disorders, and we'll have a couple of case discussions. Now, let's begin by looking at how common are these movement disorders. 3% of general population have essential tremors. Another 4% have Parkinson's disease. And another 4% suffer from Tourette syndrome. So if you just take these three movement disorders in themselves, one out of 10 people are suffering from one of these three movement disorders. So they are pretty common. Here's something that helps you understand how we look at movement disorders. So Kenny asked Cartman, is there something that cannot be described? And Cartman says very cleverly, yes, there is, but I cannot describe it. So description is very important in movement disorders. If you cannot describe a movement, it may not happen. There are four general classes of movements. If we think very broadly, there are automatic movements that happen on their own, like the digestion and movement of food inside your stomach. There are voluntary movements where we clearly make a decision to, make, to do the movement. If I reach for the class, if I reach for a cup of water, then it was volitionally initiated and I wanted to do it. There are involuntary movements, also called semi-voluntary movements. These are movements that are induced by an inner sensory stimulus. So for example, need to stretch and yawn, which is an inner sensory initiated unconscious automatic movement. However, you have an ability to reach out and take over charge of that movement. Stop it prematurely and stop it in the middle, delay it from happening. But usually you can only transiently suppress these movements and you cannot suppress them forever. 
And the most important movement class that we are concerned with most of the time are the involuntary movements where there is no clear trigger usually present. Patient is not even aware of the movement and denies any volitional control of these movements. They may or may not be suppressible, usually not by a large amount and they mostly goes, go away during sleep. Let's look at the functional anatomy of the brain. This is a slice of a brain which is from one ear to the other, so right in the middle, and you can see the two sides of the brain, one and two, and you can see the base of the brain stem here, and the, the main structures that are involved in movement disorders have been marked by these arrows. So the cerebral cortex, of course, have an initiation of the movement. The movement comes down into these structures in the deep part of the brain called basal ganglia where most of the processing of these movement happen in order to potentiate, facilitate, and continue and complete that movement. Now here's a quiz for you. Look at these structures marked 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and see how many of these you can name and I'll give you 5 seconds and if you want more time you can pause the presentation here. So as you can see, the structure up here is caudate, which is actually the head of the caudate. It's a C-shaped structure. The head of the caudate is in the wall of the lateral ventricle. Now there is a lens-shaped structure over here that you can see, and it has further portion. You can see a line dividing the outer portion called putamen with the inner portion called globus pallidus which is further subdivided into two portions. So if I draw a further line, so there's an internal portion called globus pallidus interna and an external portion. The thalamus marked here is usually not considered a part of the basal ganglia, but anterior part of the thalamus or so ventral anterior nucleus of thalamus is considered an output uh, for the basal ganglia. But more interestingly, there are structures down here. There is the red nucleus right in the middle which appears red on freshly cut brain. Then you have the dark structure here called substantia nigra. And then right above the substantia nigra, you see another collection of neurons called subthalamic nucleus because of its location under the thalamus. So these structures communicate with each other and the information comes down from the cerebral cortex into the putamen and caudate and then they talk with each other. The information is processed in through the globus pallidus interna and externa and then information is sent out to thalamus and from thalamus back up to the cortex and the substantia nigra red nucleus and subthalamic nucleus has connections with all different parts and then with each other and do the internal processing uh, that is uh, controlling the output portion. Now let's look at how we approach to movement disorders. The key concept here is phenomenology. As we have talked before, the description of movements are extremely important in movement disorders. Phenomena is the appearance of the things as they appear to us in our experiences, as they look when we look at them. So phenomenology in movement disorder is the appearance of the movements or the characteristic of the movements, the different features of the movement that makes it a typical type or particular type of movement. Here is a handy useful uh, tool to help you figure out what characteristics to look at when you're approaching to describing a movement and it's further divided into three levels of impression. An immediate impression where you look at is the movement rhythmic or arrhythmic, is it sustained or not sustained, it comes and goes or is continuous or is present in sleep or not out of prolonged observation where you're trying to figure out is the movement mostly at rest or is mostly an action or a mixture is the movement has a pattern to it is it a combination of more than one type of movements and then if you keep on looking you can start assessing the speed of the movement the amplitude the suppressibility of movement and any other behavior associated with it and based on these movement descriptions you start thinking of a tree of decision where you try to figure out which class of phenomena does this movement belong to. So let's say if we're looking at a shaking and we look at if the first question is the movement rhythmic or non-rhythmic. 
if the movement is rhythmic, then you start looking at the movements that are classified as tremors or pseudo tremors. And based on the other characteristic of that movement beyond rhythmicity, for example, jerky nature, unidirectional will be a pseudo tremor, or more flowing, more rhythmic, non jerky tremor will be a true tremor. And then is a tremor present only at rest will be a resting tremor. And if further features of these movement will then help you classify if that movement is a, a Parkinson's related rest tremor or not. So this approach, this flowing approach of decision based on the characteristic helps you classify the phenomena and then based on the classes of phenomena that you're seeing, it helps you make the decision on the diagnosis of the disease. All right, let's take a breather. Here is a brain break. This is a picture from a Holy Festival at UMC that I took two years ago. All right, let's look at some of those classes of phenomena and go over their common characteristics. And then we will review some videos which will explain those characteristics. Tremor. Tremor is an oscillatory movement caused by the alternating activation of agonist and antagonist muscle group. So for example, if you have wrist extensor and flexors, which are agonist and antagonist, and if they alternately con contract, they form an oscillation of the wrist with the hand going up and down. The movement can happen at rest, like in Parkinson's, can happen with action, like an essential tremor, and many other subtypes have been defined. The, there are some movements that look oscillatory and look like tremors and have a more jerky, unidirectional feel or movement to it, which are classified as pseudo tremor. So some movement, other movements like dystonia and myoclonus can give a tremor-like movement, usually called a dystonic tremor or a myoclonic tremor, uh, so it's a fusion of two movements. Korea. Korea comes from a Greek word for dance. It's a fast, somewhat jerky, more involuntary flowing movement. Flowing characteristic of movement is a key point here. And the randomness is another important feature where you don't have a predictability of where the movement will flow to next or which part of body will be involved next. Myoclonus is a simple very fast, jerky, shock-like movement, which is also involuntary, while dystonia is an excessive muscle contraction, which is somewhat more slow and sustained, usually either causing an abnormal posture or sometimes a jerky movement along with it, which may look like tremor, as I've said before, maybe called a dystonic tremor. Now let's look at some patient examples of these movement classes that we have gone through and look at that characteristics. Uh, uh, uh. Take a deep breath and try as long as you can. Okay. E. E. A high one. E. Okay, and a low one. We are noticing a rhythmic oscillatory movement in the voice of this patient. Uh, so this is most obviously consistent with tremor. Now the rest of the exam is trying to figure out what type of this tremor might be. So one of the features I'm trying to look at is the effect of different intonations. So low pitch, high pitch on the tremor production. Does it get better? Does it go away? As we have talked before that dystonia or dystonic tremor is dependent on certain muscles and will be seen more in certain positions than the other. Very good. Now raise your hands up in front of you. And flip them over. Bring them close to your chest. Now slowly go out all the way to the sides. And come on back 
towards your chest. Let's check your handwriting a little bit. Okay. In patient, we look at other tremor present to see what that voice tremor means. You can see as patient is extending her hands out, there is minimal tremor, more so on the right side, but not a lot. Um, and what we're trying to see is that if the tremor comes, shows up during posture holding and in certain postures or not. Now, as you can see that the patient brought the hands close to her chest, you're seeing a lot more tremors showing up. So I want to confirm that this tremor is posture dependent and I'm asking the patient to slowly move the hands out and then I would ask her to slowly move the hands back in to see if the tremor shows up in a certain position and goes away in a certain position and maybe have a neutral point where the tremor comes and goes. And that is more characteristic of a dystonic tremor and is not seen in essential tremor. The other features that she has of tremor being present on the one side, tremor starting in old age also helps me then figure out that the diagnosis is more consistent with dystonic tremor uh, as I'm suspecting with the phenomenology. 2012. Caitlin, can you please say today is a sunny day in Omaha? Today is a sunny day in Omaha. Okay. And I just want to have you just sit there for just a few minutes and just relax. Any movement you're going to have, just let it happen, okay? And then bring him in close, but don't touch. This patient is having multiple different phenomenologies. If you pay um, close attention to her, your first impression is that she's having some overall fidgetiness or restlessness that is korea you can see a flow of these random unpredictables minimal dance like movements in her feet in her hand on top of that she has a couple of other phenomena one is that she has this intermittent coughing with throat clearing kind of a sound which is exactly the same every time um, and is consist consistent with the phenomenology of a tick or vocal tick. And she has another habit very rarely and late in the video of flipping her hair, especially with the left hand, which is again a very stereotypical phenomena, which is exactly the same every time and is also concerning for tick. And here's our attempt at high note closure on stuff that really matters in life. Work hard and love your work. Say yes, maybe a little more than you say no. Thank you for listening so attentively. I hope this was very useful. I believe after end of this presentation, in 10 minutes now, you're an expert in movement disorders and you can recognize when you see a movement disorder, consider describing the characteristic of that movement and explain the phenomenology. Thank you so much.